Um, thank you for joining us um, for Haidon, a collaboration between Small Press Traffic and UC Berkeley Poetry Colloquium, which is Lindsay Troy and Leo Dunsker. Uh, they helped me organize and support this series. Um, and I miss our meetings when we were doing that work. Um, we come to you from the Bay Area as settlers on the unceded land of the Ohlone people in San Francisco, the Ramaytush, and in the East Bay, the Chocheno. We acknowledge those who have stewarded this land for thousands of years where we live, work, and rest. We honor the protectors of these traditions still present today as we care for the land and for each other. Uh, as you, uh, as we were arriving just a moment ago, we were hearing a piece from Zachary James Watkins, who will be performing tonight um, between the two readers. In a moment, I'll invite Colter Jacobson to introduce our readers. Um, we'll have Alexis Almeida read, then Zachary will perform, then Mary Berger will read. Uh, if folks have questions or thoughts during the re reading, um, feel free to type it into the chat. We may have an informal conversation at the end if thoughts and questions come up. We also, before this, um, uh, before we started, the um, five of us, we're talking about um, bringing different art forms, people who work in different art forms together. Um, we had a mix of writers and visual artists and musicians in our little space, uh, our little conversation at the start. Um, and we wanted to also invite you if, as you're experiencing the program, um, if you have thoughts about um, artists who have inspired you that are reminiscent to you as you're taking in the work, feel free to add, add that into the chat too. Uh, we can use this as a space for also, whether we talk about these things directly or not for just sharing um, what comes up for us as we're in this space together. So we invite you to do that as well. Um, now I am very pleased to invite the lovely visual artist and thinker Coulter Jacobson um, to introduce our readers. Thank you. Thank you, Sid. I like being referred to as a thinker. <laughs> Um, I first heard Alexis Almeida's poetry a couple months ago through a Club Wonder Zoom in which she read from a long poem entitled, I have never been able to sing. If you take her word for it, Alexis can't carry a tune. Not that anyone can actually hold a tune in hand. Luckily for us, she has amplified the voices of contemporary South American women, trans and queer writers by translating their poems into English. I think of translation as a generous and generative act, like braiding three voices, the writer, the translator, and the third, composite voice, to make a new and unique word harmony. Another thing I appreciate about translators is that when you introduce them, you are also introducing who they translate. Here's a partial list of Alexi's translations of contemporary South American women writers. Florencia Castellanos, Monitor's, Monitored Properties, Dalia Rossetti's Dreams and Nightmares, and Marin Juszczyk's Single Mother. Recently, Alexis has been translating works by queer trans drag performance artist and activist Pedro Lemebel, two of which Secretary Pinarte and the Technicolor fl Flavor of Le Vaga were published in the Los Angeles Review of Books. When I think about Pedro's writing, says Alexis, I think about the way it creates openings, makes spaces for cultural and linguistic nuances, especially local ones, is rigorous in its pleasure seeking, its pursuit of difference, difficulty, is striking and clarifying in its vision. This sentiment can easily be applied to Alexis's own practice and her careful choices in who she translates, striking and clarifying in their vision, making space for cultural and linguistic nuances, its pursuit of difference, difficulty. 
Alexis grew up in Chicago and has lived in Providence, Buenos Aires, and now Brooklyn, where she runs 18 Owls Press, a publication series of broadsides. She teaches in the language and thinking department of Bard and the Bard Micro College at the Brooklyn Public Library. She keeps obsessive notes that sometimes later turn into poems and lives with a cat named Tina, who has nicknames, one of which is Moo, that translates as nothing or nothingness in Japanese, your in Indonesian, him in Croatian and Polish, and must in German. She also has a wolf lamp, a pet penguin, and is ready for the snow. Mary Berger and I live in the Bay Area, and I've encountered her art and poetry quite a bit over the years. Mary grew up in the Bay Area and currently lives and works in Oakland. Like Alexis, Mary juggles a multitude of disciplines. Her visual artwork is primarily painting and mixed media. One project titled Razzle Dazzle Melanism depicts large scale butterflies repurposed with jolting black and white camouflage patterns that were used on battleships during World War I to distract radar. Another work titled Please Touch is a beautifully comforting minimal fiber work made of felted wool abstractions and geometric shapes. Like her visual art, Mary's writing takes on varied forms with a succinct sharpness from personal narrative to fiction, essays, prose, and poetry. Mary edited the book of new narrative writing, Biting the Air, and a website called Narrativity that I discovered in the early 2000s, the early days of the internet, where I first read a piece by Kathy Acker that shifted and opened up what I thought could be possible for literature. Some of Mary's books include Sunny, Then Go On, and a partial handbook for navigators. The portrait Mary chose for this reading series shows her back to the camera and viewer, heading into a strange zone, an edge, a zeroing in on place, identity as movement. Her writing invites a peripatetic proprioception, a back and forth between perception or awareness of the position and movement of bodies and Anagrams for Mary Berger, Reberry Graham, and My Rare Grub. Anagrams for Alexis Almeida, Axial Made Isle, and Llama Said Exile. I think it's to Alexis now. Thank you, Coulter. That was very funny and great. Um, hi everyone, it's really nice to be here um, and see so many faces. Um, I, I think I want to start by reading a Lewis Warsh poem. Uh, does anyone else have this book? It was so beautiful. Joe Brainerd did the cover, um, Dreaming as One. It's, a, it's out by Corinth and um, I've just been reading it a lot in the past few days. And I just wanted to read this short kind of, um, yeah, lineated poem called Flowers. I blink because my eyes hurt. I go outside when I'm bored. Not seeing you is the same as not hearing you. When I want to hear music, I turn the dial of my radio. A man comes on in a foreign voice. When the house is quiet and a big noise, puts you at ease. It's the sound of the flowers and the curtains tossing together. But when I start towards you and you're not there, head on pillow, sitting up in bed, I love the way you say, I'm so tired. But that doesn't mean anything when you say it, when I do. So, um, yeah, uh, I'm gonna read a few things. Um, I'm going to start with the uh, Pedro Lemabel, um, one of the cronicas that I just translated that Coulter mentioned. Um, I'm going to read an old poem from my friend Anne that I promised I'd read. Uh, I'm going to read some new work. Um, 
from a new poem called Green Poem, which is kind of a sad 2020 poem, but um, something new I'm working on. And then uh, I'll read from my chapbook. Um, I've never been able to sing, so I'm gonna jump around, but none of that is gonna take too long. Um, and let's see. I'm gonna start with, um, so Pedro Lemabel, uh, as Coulter was saying, uh, is a, or was, he recently died um, a few years ago. He was a drag performer, an artist, um, an activist, an amazing writer of cronicas, which are kind of something like personal essays, but more like newspaper columns. Um, and it's kind of interesting to read this particular piece because it was just after the current president was elected, Sebastian Piñera, who he hated. Um, and it's kind of, an interesting time to read about the aftermath of an election um, when it just happened. So yeah, this is called Secretary Pinarte. And it could have been during the first days of the year when the recently elect was going around appointing officials and replacing public employees left and right. Like changing curtains, they remove the administration quickly from the rummage of papers, staplers, and other ministerial office supplies. Like shaking out the tablecloth, they ejected the cultural ministers, sweeping them out from their desks, making true the film about collective eviction the earlier months had predicted. It was in those days that Don Pigny named mayors in a great formal ceremony at the Fine Art Museum and all the press and photographers were there sweating fat beads to film the right in their gala attire. The right, proud and arrogant, finally poised on the throne, finally showcasing their ordinary galas and their suits with three colored ties, the ministers, the secretaries, and assistant secretaries, and the recently named mayors were there with blanched shirts from the photograph of the first rightist siege on democracy. So much waiting for this moment, eh, said a deputy, deputy with gray eyelashes. So many years of long-haired socialists taking the economic model that Augusto started. They should be watching us so happy from the clouds, the blonde kept repeating, drying off his fragrance, fragrant sweat. There in the fine arts museum, with the sun on its forehead, with a dollar in its soul, the triumphant right showcased its recently debuted acrylic smile. For them, the morning was optimistic there in the forestal park with a pearly sun at half mast. But that morning was indifferent to me. Waking up in bed with an Ecuadorian lover after having drunk even the water from the, from the vase the night before. As if with rage, we fucked each other, my lover from Quito and I. As if taking revenge on the bad luck of having a rightist government, we did ayahuasca the entire night. And that's how we woke up, damp and numb, holding each other like orphans, but more alive than ever, and with the camel's thirst gripping the first morning kiss. Beer, my love, I asked him, but if there's none left, he laughed, yawning. Then get up, we're going to buy some, I said, throwing the sheets back. And like that, half asleep, half sick, we walked down the park sidewalk, heading toward the liquor store. The morning was golden, they had recently watered the grass in the city parks. They'd recently put up barriers on the museum sidewalk so people couldn't pass by. They're probably filming another commercial, I said to the boy, but he retorted by pointing toward the gathering of people watching the parade of civil officials and soldiers decked out like an Easter tree. And like it was nothing, like it was all the same to me, I walked out right in front of them. In reality, I was fuming that they were occupying the sidewalk for their demonstrations. And it was then, it was at that moment, he saw me and rushed up to me with his hand outstretched saying, what a pleasure, Pedro, to have you here. It was Pinarte, the secretary of culture, the soap opera actor, the emergent aristocrat with an iron suit coming toward me with a fake smile. And me, half asleep, half disgusted at such arrogance, I look at him, I size him up, I assess, and without so much as a warning, I spit on the ground exactly one centimeter from his shiny shoe. This is very ugly, Pedro, the secretary yelled at me, lifting his hands theatrically. This is very ugly. He reiterated his lines with an exaggerated drama that turned his cheeks red. 
The Ecuadorian within half a block embraced me, confessing his admiration for my bravado. But it's going to have costs, he cautioned, taking his hand off my shoulder. He's the cultural authority, and that awkward moment isn't going to be forgotten because you offended him and he's only trying to say hi. But he should know my anti-right position, I answered indignantly. It came from my soul, I couldn't stop him. But he'll soon forget it. The petty aristocrats erase memory. It doesn't suit them. For that reason, they're not resentful. The amnesia sharpens their political power. And I wasn't so mistaken because the next day the secretary appeared in the newspaper declaring that I was a resentful nostalgic. See, he's right. I'm a talible de resentido, I whispered to the Ecuadorian making swirls on his arms. Okay, um, so now I'm gonna read an old poem um, for my friend Anne, I think she's here. Um, and this is from an old manuscript um, that I was writing a few years ago that I think might kind of fold back into what I'm writing now. Um, and it's called Poem in Which You Become the Hands on My Stomach uh, after Renee Gladman. Today the lake was blue. Today the lake was blue without knowing the lake was a lake. The lake was blue without knowing. The lake was blue without knowing the lake was blue and blue at its edges and blue in its waves. The lake was blue without knowing blue and without touching the blue or the green. The lake was blue without seeing blue or seeing above the blue at its edges and also seeing the green at its edges, without seeing the waves crash against the yellow sand, without seeing the danger in the waves crashing against the yellow sand and the animals like crabs scurrying toward the waves and the people walking like nothing was happening and seeing the blue of the waves and thinking how beautiful while all the while they were turning towards some light in the sky. Today the lake was blue and the people there were walking and looking and turning towards some light in the sky and the animals were moving toward the crashing waves. And without visually seeing the blue turn to green, the memory of the blue was sitting inside all of them. It was sitting inside them like something someone had mentioned about the sky, like the imprint left on a body when it has turned but is no longer aware of its turning. How could a story just end otherwise? And this was one form of life turning into another. Today the lake was blue and without knowing blue, the lake had turned green and the people were walking and the crabs were rushing toward the crashing waves. And the memory of the blue was like an imprint on the yellow sand. And the sand was a memory, it was like a memory someone had mentioned once. It was the passing of so many memories into the light of one form into another. So the waves were there and the blue was sitting inside them, all those who were no longer present in their turning. And we were walking and laughing and thinking how beautiful Without knowing, without thinking, nothing was happening. We were turning toward the lake at its edges, toward some other light in the sky. Okay, um, now I'm going to just read a little bit from this new poem called Green Poem. Sorry, I never know where to look. Uh, okay, so. I'm looking at the document and I can see some of you. Cool. Uh, green poem. I wrote so little this year. I held small things with my eyes. And when I couldn't, I walked small distances. And where I used to be, I wasn't quite. And when I went back there, I walked a little faster. I took pictures of shaky light on walls and small quilts on the internet. I felt known in the scene of a photograph. My animal curled up beside me and in my dreams was often lost, but later seemed to want to imagine this fact. Cars or lightning bugs filled the surface of dirty windows like the last brief phase of summer, but I always felt like summer was over when it was happening. 
I had things in my pocket I wasn't supposed to touch. The wet air in my hands made my hands feel skittish and small. At the grocery store, I looked three people in the eyes and we all became paranoid. My voice was, uh, was absurdly loud even to me. I usually like food. I used to love in public. I got embarrassed when my eyes ricocheted off the metal surfaces of stock refrigerators where my shoulder perked up after being accidentally touched. There's a way that a gaze when absorbed by so many things can lose its fatigue and brutality, appears briefly suspended. I wasn't looking at anything and I wanted to intercept it, but this writing doesn't remember how. In a dream, you might run from love or dream to love and run in circles. You might cut the book to read the book, but it won't change the fact that in the daylight when you fall in love, you'll still have to wait. Old things piled up. A few metal blenders arrived from Craigslist and a blanket with an iconic green stripe that made everything around it seem basic and dull. I closed my eyes and touched it obsessively the way I thought a child might. I looked for you in sharp lined objects, but I can't see you. You're always between forms. I did things I mostly couldn't share. Scanned my work checks on my lap with my phone, made mental apologies and photographed my own face on walks, little ruptures with the day. It was hard to sleep, but my, why remember a sad thing sadly? Why fake the night or rub rubble? I sometimes like to remember the way a hand looked reaching for something on a table, then floating above it while others made comfort. Someone grabs a bottle and leans back on their elbows. Another loses her grip on a can. How I might impatiently watch some food make its way across the table. How I might move my hand secretly to your abdomen, the muscles there. Okay, I think I'm gonna stop there actually. Um, so yeah, and lastly, I'm just going to read from this tattered copy of my chapbook. Um, I have never been able to sing, just read from it, um, a few poems. Um, I have never held a gun. I have never fired a rifle. I have never been aimed at by a pistol. I have never rescued a person from death. I haven't been repeatedly beaten, though I have been hit and shaken. I'm scared of being alone, though around other people I often want to leave. I don't scare easily. I never trusted the idea of unconditional love, though I have often wanted to be loved unconditionally. I prefer silence to small talk. I think it's impossible to retract a statement. I'm not outdoorsy, indoorsy, summery, wintry. My sense of things can come from ideas instead of experience. I prefer being barefoot. I love the crackle of a wooden floor. I have never known exactly who to tell. I've never made sense of a geranium. I have a ticket stub in my hand. I found it in my pocket. I will tell you in the morning. I have the face of someone younger. People are often surprised by my age. I'm crippled and not crippled by illness. I haven't made plans to go to Antarctica, Russia, or Hungary, though I would like to. I buy impractical shoes, hats, jackets. I browse erratically. I prefer traveling to arriving. I never stop suddenly. I've never walked across an entire landscape in dread. I have never climbed a scaffold. I've never climbed a fence without climbing down the other side. I've never not thought of you when watching a pinwheel. I often doubt my responses to questions. I taught everything I know about, I taught myself everything I know about cooking, bikes, photography. If I film something, I often wonder when it's happening. I'm best when someone loves me or when I feel like someone is going to love me. I get used to things quickly. I'm drawn to faces more than bodies. There are powerful currents inside me. I've never turned a radio off with my mind. I have never moved. I never moved. I've never success successfully hidden from a strobe light. I've never been recognizable from an airplane. I've never divorced, eloped, or ghosted. I've never replaced a person with another person. I've never really forgotten. 
I'm immune to certain diseases, though I can't predict the future. Somewhere my problems are hiding. I move toward and away from the middle. I don't have a favorite memory of lunch. I've never lived exactly on a border. I can't play sirens. I don't have a perfect pitch or a photographic memory. I have an intuitive sense of music, though I also understand scales and modes. I've been told to be quiet and to speak louder. I whisper into pillows. I prefer windows to aisles. When someone touches my shoulder, I imagine them touching me elsewhere. I like waking up naked. I'm not particularly stubborn. When I look at a photograph, when I look at something in a photograph, I think if this is real, it must be paused. I've never climbed a mountain or wanted to climb a mountain. I have no point of contact. When I fall in love, I can feel myself emptying. I rarely feel tired from walking. I have never been able to hold my entire head in my hands. I have never dreamed, I never dream. I can't reach across a lake. I can't hide behind a flower. I've been followed, cat called, pushed. I've been mistaken for my friend and my mother when she was young. I have a strange feeling. I wonder if you're near. I don't believe that if something comes later, it must be better. I rarely fantasize about warmer places. Numbers bring me comfort. I'm not an object, substance, idea, or thought. Do people walk to escape walking? Does intimacy follow the illusion of intimacy? I've grown more cautious. I'm not striving for subtlety. I don't believe doors are objects. I don't rely on mere images. I will never look past all these fields in my mind. I've never held a mouse. I've never held a muskrat. I've never held a goose. I've never bleated. I've never made the sound of an egret. I don't believe in my height as my wingspan. I will never successfully fit inside a mollusk shell. I have not buried my food. I've never been suspicious of a rabbit. I have not skied, surfed, snowshoed. I have not scuba dived, rode, sc scuba dived, rodeoed, spelunked. I have never run a marathon. I have never polished my shoes. I have not sat down in my bathtub. I have not felt at home in the ocean. I have never been a whale. I have not grown older in my hearing, only in my taste buds, my voice, my face. I've never moved away from here. Leaving can seem painful. I avert my attention. I'm not unlike a child this way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexis. Uh, we're now for some music. Um, Zachary James Watkins, about 15 years ago, went to um, the world-renowned music department at Mills College uh, while I was there for poetry. And I met him then because we both rode the Mills shuttle bus to school, uh, which would do a loop from Rock the Rock Ridge BART station to Mills. Um, so since then, I've uh, kept an eye on his work and career um, with a feeling of a kind of siblinghood. Um, and he has a long list of accomplishments and is best known here in the Bay for his band Black Spirituals. Um, and I am honored to welcome Zachary Watkins. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Alexis, um, I, I really uh, appreciate the work you shared tonight, so thank you so much. Um, and I look forward to researching your work further. Um, and Sid, thank you so much. That's a great memory. I would walk to Rock Ridge from around Shattuck and 55th. And it was a beautiful walk in the morning. And then I'd take a shuttle to Mills. It was great. Yeah, I was coming from uh, Telegraph and Alcatraz. I would do the walk from there. So yeah. Yes, <laughs> amazing. That's so right. And our different drivers were such characters. Do you remember? Oh my gosh. Okay, I'm going to play some of my um, synthesizer music. 
All right. Thank you all. I really appreciate this.
Yay! That was fun. Thank you. That was thank great. You, thank, thank, you, you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Um, Mary, are you ready? We're going to have Mary Berger reading. Um, Coulter's intro. We'll just reference Coulter's introduction from the beginning, and um, we welcome Mary Berger. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, I'm, hearing I'm hearing it. it. How's that? I fixed the sound. I have a setting for the music, and now I have to switch it back, but now it's good. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, wow, thank you, Zachary and Alexis, for those gorgeous performances. I feel like my nervous system has been realigned in a very good way. Um, thank you, Coulter, for that introduction, and um, nice to see you again. Thank you, Small Press Traffic and Sid, for the chance to do this, for bringing us all together. Um, thank you, SVT, also for the small time residency that gave me a chance a couple of years ago to spend a couple of weeks in Point Arena, which is a spectacular little coastal town a few hours north of San Francisco. So I spent a lot of time walking along the coastal bluffs there and also spent some time writing. Um, I've been working on a memoir for a couple of years. It doesn't have a title yet. Um, but I'm going to read a small section of it, and that title, is, that section is called An Absence at the Center. Um, I refer to people in the, in the story by their first initials rather than by names. And as much as I would love to claim to be a California native, I actually grew up in a small town in Ohio. That may or may not be relevant <laughs> to this work. Archaeological layers collapse into one another as time accumulates on top of time. Things that once held their place in separate eras, in separate airspace, sift together as the air escapes, as solid sediments commingle into overlapping strata. Then it's the job of those who come in yet another airspace to pull time back into separate layers again. This sister, 22 years older than me. This girl, this woman, G, who had the same parents as me. She went to Germany the year before I was born for a year of study abroad, then stayed for two more years. She worked in the office of the Thailand consulate, no doubt a modest operation in West Germany in the 1960s. She organized papers, typed letters. She babysat the consulate's children. She bought herself a sturdy German bicycle for getting around. She enjoyed this life. This life sounded like the beginning of something. A story I wanted to hear. A story I wanted to be in. Let's call it falling. I have thought a lot about how to ascribe agency to an act of suicide. Not the suicide of noble sacrifice for God or country. Not the suicide when death by more abhorrent means, like execution or disease, is imminent. Not the suicide triggered by psychosis, when the difference between living and dying starts to blur. G attempted suicide. In despair, in desperation, in isolation, in pain. 4,000 miles from home, she fell under the weight of these things. These things pulled her, knocked her to the ground. And all the king's horses and all the king's men. I try to make my little body break her fall. To grab her under the shoulders in my two-year-old arms, pull her back up all the flights of stairs, sit with her at the window. Was it a window? Was it a roof edge? And look down down at the street, at the buildings, at the gardens and trees, what was down there? Talk to her about any ordinary thing. I want to make it not be. Her body hit the ground and I broke open. She had her sturdy German bike shipped home. 
while she herself flew prone, broken, immobilized. Decades later, she said, I guess I thought I'd still be able to ride it. Who packed it and carried it to the freight station for her? What else did they send along? Books, clothes. What does a student accumulate during a visa stay? Her Langenscheidt's German English pocket dictionary, 1200 tissue thin pages in eight point type that she would give to me years later. One of the ways that I felt her life fit around me like a warm, well-made coat, something to care for. This is from my sister. She studied in Germany and then I did too. One way her life threatened to pull me down, a sodden heavy jacket in a soaking rain. From her, I learned the extent of fragility, of vehemence. Her distress signals lighted my way, not waving, but drowning. She showed me intelligence uncontained, chaotic and dangerous. I followed her without question. I followed her out to sea. This work, a second heart beating inside of me. Words course through their systems of vessels feeding organs that can't be reached another way. Words penetrate and generate the body. The first time I heard the word lung, I also heard the word pneumonia. Or maybe that's not right. Would a four-year-old already know the word lung? What about a four-year-old in my family? In the doctor's waiting room, too sick to sit upright, leaning into my mother. I did know this is one of those times like church, like a long car ride when you have to sit still and wait. Dr. McDonald, the pediatrician had I suppose been our family doctor since G and my oldest siblings were small. Wire rimmed glasses, a fringe of gray hair, dark suit, kind eyes, a distant air, thick pink, pink cough syrup, cherry cough drops, speckled orange baby aspirin, the next morning I came downstairs and threw up on the dark blue flowered carpet a few steps from the bathroom door. There was a phone call and then a cyclone of activity. I was to be taken to the hospital. My youngest sister, M, then 18, had taken the family car that morning to go to her job at a different hospital by pointless coincidence as a nursing assistant or a patient attendant, or really, I have no idea. My mother and father bundled me into my father's pickup truck me on my mother's lap and my dad at the wheel. And eventually there must have been parking, check-in, being walked, carried, wheeled through corridors. I was placed in a bed in a ward with four or five other girls. I had an oxygen tent, clear plastic covering the upper half of the bed so I could sit up, eat, look around without emerging. I suppose there were antibiotics and cough medicine. Did someone explain to me what oxygen was? Did I ask? When my mother finally had to go, I'm sure she didn't want to. Inevitably, I would have cried. After dinner, eaten from a tray in bed, someone came through to deliver the first joy of the day, a plastic cup of ice cream with a little wooden paddle spoon, its shape a flat pacifier after the ice cream was gone. I got ice cream every, every night for the week I was there. It was my first experience of a rhythm outside of my family. My mother had one other daughter in a hospital just then. My sister G, who had dropped herself, lost herself at the base of a wall, who had come back to herself with a broken spine and a shattered soul, who after she'd been collected and wrapped and flown back home, after she'd reconstructed, been reconstructed and set into a posture to heal, to grow back at least some of what she'd broken and start again, could not get down with the program could not agree that growing her bones back together was a thing that she wanted to do. And so she collected her pain medication day by day, pill by pill, until she felt she had enough to do this thing and swallow them down in a fistful. And when that didn't work, when she was found vomiting and had her stomach pumped or some other unbidden rescue scenario, she was somehow left with the opportunity and the wherewithal to do it all again. And only then was it decided that she could not be allowed to try it one more time. I hadn't met this sister yet. She was one of the names my mother sometimes said. She was a picture on the wall. 
I tell this story through interpolation, retranslation of the bits and oddities a child left for me. The child is an unreliable archivist. The child remembers that the front yard flooded when it rained, that the bike left behind by an older sibling was too big, so she had to ride it standing up, that the best lunch happened on Saturdays, homemade pizza and Coke. I sift through a palimpsest of sensations that have no more veracity than the dregs of tea, and I have no taste for divination. On the front seat of the car, riding with my mother, still four years old, five, had she told me, we're going to see your sister, we're going to the hospital, we're going to take a drive, a longish drive to a strange city, a wide bridge over a river. Now I find that there was a psychiatric hospital in the town over, next town over from ours, not quite eight miles from our house. It was down the highway and across the river. Is that the one? The hospital room was dim. That seems accurate. G has always hated bright lights and especially sunshine. I stood by the window, looked at her shyly and then looked away again. G talked to me from the bed, asked me questions, waited for my answer, smiled at me. It wasn't that no one else ever talked to me, but this person seemed to take a special notice, made me feel suddenly that I was more than someone's child. I was me. What of this have I recovered and what have I superimposed? That my mother and I left not long after, that there was strain on my mother's face and a deserted look on G's. The hospital that I find on the map now is in the same town where my mother used to take me to story hour at the library when I was learning to read. Persuading myself that I am reconstructing rather than constructing this story or that at least the construction uses authentic period materials seems the essence of this work. But what does it matter that an origin story is indeterminate or that the tea leaves can be read a thousand ways? And why do I keep equating storytelling with divination? Poking at the palimpsest, trying to assemble the traces into clues. What is the self that it needs to be persuaded of its own form? One thing I am certain of, there came a time, for how long, I don't know, when G came home from the hospital to live with us in the little yellow brick house that her parents had built when G was the smallest child. It must have been summer when she came, probably for no more than a few weeks. She slept in the breezeway, the small screened in porch between the house and the garage. It was a way for her to have a room to herself since my parents and two youngest brothers and youngest sister and I filled the bedrooms. And since G couldn't climb the stairs in any case, she slept on the glider, a kind of rocking sofa that folded flat into a bed. I don't remember the day she came and I don't remember if she ate meals at the table with us or if my mother carried food to her on the porch. She took on the role of a distinguished visitor. I wasn't to bother her but I could sit with her if she asked me to. She taught me the color spectrum. For some reason, maybe because there was no other place for it, my mother's sewing cabinet, a small chest of drawers, was in the breezeway too. The top flipped open to reveal a tray with spools of thread. During one of my visits with her, my sister performed a slow motion magic trick to organize the spools like the shades of the rainbow reds to oranges to yellows to greens and all the way through to purple. My mother's task-driven days, I think, didn't give time for organizing the spools, only for picking them out and dropping them back in again as she used them. For my mother, sorting the thread was a mildly absorbing task, a way to bring a little order to her chaos. For me, it was discovering a sixth sense. Before I'd seen the thread spectrum, Colors were individual flavors, sticks of gum that I liked or didn't. Afterwards, they became something like a language, an arrangement of terms that got meaning from one another and changed their meanings in different combinations. They had a particular order, an origin story even, but they could be rearranged any way one liked. My tendency to sort the colors in my crayon box by spectral position 
started that day. Her leaving was as mysterious as her arrival, though there are photographs recording it. One day it was announced that my sister was moving to, I had no way of knowing New York City then, so I'm not sure what I thought. She wanted pictures of us all. My brothers and I lined up on our bikes in the driveway, they on their spider bikes with banana seats, and me on my child's bike with training wheels. Not big enough yet for the discarded German bike or the beach cruisers left behind by other absent siblings. There's another picture, a snapshot I uncovered years later. My parents, my two young brothers and I stand clustered in the driveway. My mother's hands on my shoulders pulling me back on my heels towards her. All of us gazing into the camera with smiles of varying conviction. We're joined by two strangers, a young couple in their 20s, the woman in a Chanel inspired suit and upswept hair, the man in the narrow legged slacks and cardigan of the day. They smiled politely. My sister M is somewhere else, maybe at work or school. My oldest sister L is a few miles away in her own house, with their own small children. My oldest brother R has long since left home for the opposite coast. The one taking the picture is the one who is about to leave. The one who more than any of us should be before the cam <coughs> excuse me, before the camera having her image recorded. I want to know what she looked like that day. The story of how she ended up in New York carries the same sparse detail as any part of her life from those years. I know only that she had friends, those in the snapshot, who took her, maybe in a 60s era sedan, and helped her find work as a secretary. In her version, she went out of desperation, not ambition or eagerness that she moved on quickly from the secretarial job, that she learned computer programming in night school, starting with key punch cards, which drifted through her apartment for years after they had reached their obsolescence, repurposed as scrap paper, that she eventually worked as a programmer at the United Nations for 25 years. She acknowledges no courage or achievement in her acts. I want to pull her back from the black holes threshold. I want to complicate the narrative to give it a different path. Thank you.